thank you very much for having me uh, over Zoom here tonight, talk about invasive species. I am excited to be joined by Karen and also whoever listens to this here in the future uh, as it is being recorded. Uh, I'm excited to talk about invasive species tonight just because I think this is a really interesting topic. It's one that takes up a lot of time for me as an entomologist. I know that uh, probably 60 or 70 percent of my calls seem to uh, come from these different invasive species. You can think of things like Japanese beetles and multicolored Asian lady beetles from the past that have kind of made up the bulk of these kinds of questions and queries that people have. But we have new invasive species coming in all the time, it seems like. Uh, there's always a new one on the block. And so these ones that we're going to cover tonight, some of them for Kentuckians, they're things that are here but are still spreading in the state. Some of them are things that are kind of on the border and we need to keep a close eye out for them. And others are things that they live in the state, but they have a very limited range. And they're things that we all need to be aware of. We need to be teaching each other about them and just making sure that we get this kind of information out. So that's kind of what we're covering here this evening. I wanna start with a pest that's probably familiar with a lot of folks in the state of Kentucky, the emerald ash borer. It's an invasive pest that's been present in the state of Kentucky since 2009. It's originally from Asia. Its native range is located up here in the corner of China, over into Korea and some of the islands of Japan, but it's been in the United States probably since the late 1990s or the early 2000s. It was first confirmed in the U.S. in Detroit, Michigan in 2002, and it came most likely in wooden shipping pallets like you see there on the right. We have a lot of invasive species that have arrived in the country in this form. They can hitch a ride as a larva inside of the wood. They can hitch a ride as an adult hiding between the slats of wood. We have a lot of global trade and travel now. And so when these pallets arrive, they're kind of left out in the open in a lot of places. And whatever's living in there can complete its development or escape and then get into the environment around it. And we often see these invasive problems begin in port type cities like Detroit, Michigan. So it's been making its way across Kentucky. As I mentioned, 2009, it was first discovered in the state. All of the counties colored in green here in this map from the Kentucky Forest Service are states where the problem has been found between the years 2009 and 2020. Here in 2021, we have had three counties of Western spread. These were Hopkins County, Warren County, and Metcalf. I think it's very interesting to see that in the state of Kentucky, not all of the counties have been filled in yet. Not all of them have had an infestation found of emerald ash borer. It's been around for some time, but a lot of the efforts that the Kentucky Forest Service has implemented and the Office of the State Entomologist seem to have helped to slow it down in the state and give people time to prepare. It's a very impressive thing to see. So these states or these counties out west are kind of preparing for this bug still. Uh, they're waiting to get infested with it. We're trying to prepare new educational material for them. Unfortunately, uh, this is one of the pests that's kind of been forgotten. People don't necessarily talk about it as much anymore. There's not as much literature being produced on it. And so we do want to try and provide as much up-to-date information as we can for everybody that's getting exposed to it. Now, it's old news in the east part of the state, but in the west, they need new, fresh information. So you can see there's still some areas to fill in there. Just in terms of its life cycle, it has a pretty interesting one because it lives inside of trees as a larva. So if you look, you can see the larva on the left here. They go through three instars of development under the bark of the tree. They live in the cambium layer, so they're feeding in that upper portion of the wood, and they make these serpentine tunnels. Right around now, they're starting to figure out that it's coming up on fall, and so in September and October, they'll go into a pre-pupil stage where they kind of turn themselves into this J shape in the wood, and then over the winter, they'll fully pupate to emerge next May, and they will fly around as adults to mate and lay their eggs in the tree bark and start the whole process over again. The larvae do hatch out around mid-June, feeding up until about mid-August. You can see a close-up of one there on the right or on the left. They're kind of, they almost look like a tapeworm. They're a little creepy little thing. They're flat. They're called flat-headed borers because of their head shape. They have these segmented bodies that look kind of like bells. And you can see those tunnels that they create underneath the bark. So it's very cryptic. We don't always know that this is happening when the infestation first occurs. It's sort of insidious in that way. And that damage accumulates over seven to 10 years until ultimately it will kill the tree. Uh, that one has been infested for quite some time and you can see there's barely any tree left under the bark. Ultimately, what they do is deprive the tree of food and water and it can't feed itself anymore, can't water itself anymore. 
and it withers away, dries up, and dies. So if we want to be on the lookout for emerald ash borer in the state of Kentucky, if you have an ash tree, uh, if you're in the western portion of the state and your county hasn't been listed as infested yet, some of the early things to be on the lookout for is to watch the upper one-third of your ash tree's canopy. These insects like to start out in the tippy tops of the trees so they can prolong the amount of time they can infest that plant. So the dieback begins at the top. You'll start to notice it progress into the middle part of the canopy. Once it starts to get around eye level, it's too late to do anything. That tree has been infested for too long and we won't be able to save it. But that early symptom, looking at the tops of the trees and noticing just an odd lack of leaves and spots that used to have them, and that'll help you to know that your tree may be dealing with this bug. You'll also notice sucker growth on the lower portions of the tree. Suckers are when the tree shoots out these leafy branches trying to create more photosynthetic material. They can't feed themselves from the top of the tree, so you'll see these branches pop up on the lower limbs, even the trunk, and even down towards the roots, they'll start popping up out of the ground. You'll also notice an increase in things like woodpeckers feeding on the tree. Woodpeckers are bug-eating birds. They will fleck the tree. You can see on the left there that they've ripped off pieces of the bark trying to get to the delicious larvae that are underneath the bark. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet for them. There's hundreds of insects under there for them to rip out and eat. If they would just glue the bark back when they got done, they'd be almost helpful biocontrol agents. But alas, Woody the woodpecker isn't real, and we're not going to see that level of technology with them but they do cause some damage themselves as they go through. And this is another indicator your tree may be suffering from EAB. There's also D-shaped exit holes and then splits in the bark. The D-shaped exit hole is what a lot of people have heard about with this pest. You'll look in the lower right here, you can see an image of a D next to a quarter. It is characteristic, it's diagnostic for this pest, but unfortunately it's also very hard to see. And especially in the early stages where something could be done about the problem, those D-shaped exit holes are in the upper one-third of the canopy. I don't know many people that spend a lot of time in the upper one-third of their tree. And once these D-shapes are at eye level, the problem has progressed too far. So it is something that's diagnostic, but it's not always the, the easiest thing for us to use. It's important to point out this is a problem for ash trees and some very close relatives of ash, including white fringe tree but you're not going to see it in maple, you're not gonna see it in your sycamore, you're not gonna see it in your sassafras tree, it is just ash, but it's also all of the ashes. So white ash, black ash, green ash, blue ash, kiss all the ashes goodbye, basically. Uh, the mountain ash is a species that's kind of misnamed. It's not a true ash, ash, it's not in the same genus as them. So it doesn't get EAB, but all of these other ones will be impacted. Blue ash has been found to have some uh, repellent properties, but it's still one that they'll feed on uh, if they don't have any choices. So left untreated, emerald ash borer is going to kill all of these kinds of ash trees. Uh, it's not a good thing for them to have it. It's not a pretty sight. So this is a, a pretty drastic thing for parts of the state. This is because if you look throughout history, we love monocultures as humans. We love to have all of the same type of tree, same types of plants in a given area. It's something that we, we seem, to, seem to do a lot. Uh, we should have learned our lesson probably in the 50s and 60s when Dutch elm disease came through and wiped out all of the beautiful American elms that we had, but we didn't learn our lesson. Many neighborhoods that dealt with that then went through and planted all ash to replace all of those elms. And so we had all of these neighborhoods with beautiful ash cathedrals like you see here. If I lived in this neighborhood, I might nickname it something like Shady Meadows. Uh, it's beautiful, it's wonderful to have this, but with emerald ash borer, as it goes through areas, if people don't prepare, you can see what happens. They lose all of those trees. Uh, this is drastic. It's, I would call this maybe sunny acres now. It's a different look, obviously. You can see there's mud in the street from stormwater runoff. Uh, there's a lot less shade in this neighborhood, so air conditioning bills are probably much higher, and the property values will go down because there's fewer mature trees. So it is drastic. It was more drastic in states like Indiana and Ohio and Michigan, where the problem first occurred. We've seen less of this in states like Kentucky and Illinois and Tennessee and, other, and even Maryland, uh, because there was more time to prepare and hopefully prevent some of this. But we still have seen lots of trees lost because of this bug. There are things that we can do in order to protect the plants. Systemic treatments where we treat the tree by injecting it, or treating the soil around it. 
will keep the tree safe from emerald ash borer. It will help to repel it. And if you have a tree that's already infested, if it still has about 50% of its leaves, you can still help that tree to recover with a treatment. You can see the proof in the pudding here where there's some treated trees and untreated ones nearby. So it is something that can be done. Not all trees should be protected though. Not all of them can handle being treated. We need to be very judicious with insecticides, of course. These are good tools to have, but we have to be very wise with our tools. We don't want to misuse them. So going around and making sure that the tree isn't suffering from other problems like stem girdling roots, it hasn't been damaged in a storm, uh, it's not half dead from some other problem already. If you want to keep that tree around, it's probably not advisable just because the, the more damage a tree has, the more stressed it is, the less likely it is to survive anyway. But if it's your prized ash tree, it has a lot of health, a lot of years left in it, those trees can be prioritized and we can treat them and remove some of the less hardy ones and replace them with a different species, hopefully introducing some biodiversity into the environment. There are lots of options. Sometimes homeowners want to do it themselves. You can use products like Bayer Advanced Tree and Shrub, Ortho Tree and Shrub, or another one called Optrol. These can be used on a tree that's up to 20 inches in diameter at breast height. So in order to figure out if you can treat your tree on your own, you do have to get a tape measure out, a cloth one, measure the circumference of your tree and do some math. But if it's up to that 20 inches in diameter, you can do it yourself with these products, mixing them up in a bucket and pouring it around the base of the tree, around the root flare. Other times we have to turn to a professional. Certified arborists are out there. You can check your state to see if there's the Kentucky State Arborist Association, uh, the Maryland State Arborist Association, since we have a Marylander on the call with us tonight. Uh, there's lots of state organizations like this. There's also national ones, and they can help you to find local people that are certified arborist tree experts that usually are also certified to apply systemic products. So they can either inject the soil, inject the tree, help you to figure out and make some decisions about the plant. There are several products that they can offer. There's one-year products like Safari or Merit or Zytec. These have to be reapplied every year. Same is true for the homeowner products. And then we have this other one called triage. It has a different active ingredient in it and you can actually apply it every three years and still have protection for the tree. So there's lots of options. There's things out there that we can use to try and combat emerald ash borer. Another insect that's already in the state of Kentucky has got a foothold and is spreading around is a brown marmorated stink bug, also shortened to BMSB. If you hear anything about invasive species, you usually find out that there are a lot of acronyms. We call them EAB, BMSB. Uh, we like to shorten these things because they often have long names. So these are invasive stink bugs. They were introduced from Asia. They were first discovered in Allentown, Pennsylvania in 2001. They are a plant pest as well as an overwintering pest, very similar to the multicolored Asian lady beetle. They like to get into our houses. And as we go through this tonight, you'll hear me talk about Pennsylvania a lot. It seems like poor Pennsylvania always ends up as the first sort of breeding ground for these invasive pests. The name for this one comes from their mottled brown and bronze appearance. They are a shield bug. So you can see that they kind of have that shield shape like you see with medieval knights, but this shield is rusty. It's got dots all over it. It's got that brown and mottled appearance, marmorated as the name implies. They have smooth shoulders. So you can see over here, they've got these kind of pointy shoulders that stick out, but there's no spikes on there, which is important to differentiate them from some other lookalikes. They also have these white bands on their antenna at the tip and towards the middle. And then they also have a gray colored belly. If you flip them over, you'll see their belly is kind of speckled, but it's also this yellowish gray color. The lookalikes that are out there have some, some slight differences. One of the more commonly confused ones for the brown marmorated stink bug is the brown stink bug. You just look at these names. Entomologists are really bad at naming things. We got the brown stink bug, the green stink bug, the dusky stink bug. We just don't seem to come up with very creative names for these things. Uh, but the brown stink bug has some serration to the edge of its abdomen or to its thorax. The green stink bug is obviously green on top. Uh, the spine shoulder bug has actual spikes that kind of jut out from their shoulder area. There are also differences in belly color. So the brown stink bug, if you flip it over, they have a lime green belly that's different than the brown marmorated stink bug. 
but there are lots of them out there that get confused for this one. This has been spread over a lot of the US since its original introduction. You can see in this map that's slightly out of date from 19 uh, that it's been detected in many states. There are nuisance problems in several states as well. And there's also states that are listed as having severe agricultural and nuisance problems. We are our own worst enemy with insects like this. We have absolutely aided in their travel with trucks and transport by moving them across the entire nation and offloading them and then they get out into an area. There's not a lot of natural enemies for them in the United States and so they kind of breed with abandon. They go from egg to adult in about 40 to 60 days. The immature form, the nymphal stage as you see here, is sort of uh, spotted in appearance with these bands on the back. There's usually two generations of brown marmorated stink bugs here in the United States. The nymphs overall, they look similar in shape to the adult version. They lack the wings and they lack some of the speckling that we see with the adults of the, of the species, but they still have those bands on their antenna and some of the speckling towards the front. They are a pest on lots of things. They feed on tree nuts, uh, they feed on fruits, they feed on vegetables, berries, they lot, like lots of field crops. I don't know about you, but I don't want this corn or this tomato that we see in these images here. Their damage comes from their ability to plunge their needle-like mouth part into whatever it is that they want to eat. So they basically have a hypodermic needle on their face. They stick it into the plant and they suck juices out. It's very traumatic for the plant. You can see how deflated these garden crops look. You can see on a blueberry here on the left, an apple in the middle, and then a pepper on the right. There's corkiness that comes from this. So the tissue takes on this sort of discolored, different texture. There's necrosis and chlorotic spots. Sometimes as they feed, their saliva damages the, the young fruit. And so then the fruit continues to grow and it will fold over in on itself. And we call that cat facing because sometimes it starts to look like the, the fleshy part of a cat's face. It's just not great. These products are no longer marketable except usually as pig slop. Uh, they're not something that you're going to be able to sell at the farmer's market or eat out of your own garden. So they're very annoying, very destructive in that way. They do have a lot of things they like to eat, apple, beans. Uh, they love edamame, eggplant, pears, grapes. They love nectarines. They love redbud trees. They like to eat on peppers. There's other things that they don't like as much like asparagus and blueberries, but they'll still feed on them. Some of the low risk crops include carrot, garlic, ginkgo, uh, they don't like to feed on potatoes and onions and sweet potatoes and spinach. You'll notice with a lot of these, we're talking about leafy crops or tubers that are underground. So I think it kind of makes sense why they don't end up becoming a problem on those. They love the big puffy fruits that we also like to enjoy. Aside from all of this damage they cause agriculturally, they also love to get inside of buildings. We have found them in homes, office buildings, warehouses, and they get together in these big stink bug parties like you see here, and they hang out for the winter so they can stay nice and toasty. They think our homes are these giant deluxe heated logs that they've discovered. It's like the greatest Airbnb for a stink bug. So they don't feed or mate when they're inside. They can't get active on warmer days. What happens is you'll get a, a 50 degree day in January randomly, and the stink bugs will be like, oh, maybe it's spring. Maybe I'll start getting active and they start crawling around on people's ceilings and getting close to their windows. Uh, they are stinky, as the name implies. Some people describe it as a coriander-like odor. I think that's an insult to coriander, personally, but it is a, a weird sort of spicy odor. Um, ultimately, some people are kind of allergic to this smell, as well as the skins and the particles that they may cast off in their feces. So it is not great to have them in your home. They can stain things. They're very annoying. If you look at this image on the left there, those are all stink bugs trying to get into that house. Uh, that's terrifying. It's almost like an invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing. They like high and cool locations. So we find them in soffits and attics. They'll get under siding. They love to be in a narrow space. They want to feel kind of snug as a bug in a rug. So they often get behind cracks. They'll get behind baseboards. They like to be around the windows and trim. They'll get in around exhaust fans or lights and ceilings. And then once they're inside, they're going to settle down for the whole winter, basically. Uh, that ends that one. So there's lots of other pests that are all out there. There is, are There are some that are kind of on our border here in Kentucky. And one of those is the Asian longhorn beetle, also known as ALB. 
This is an invasive longhorn beetle native to China and Korea. And the history of its interactions with the United States, it was first found in New York City in 1996. It has since been found in other places in New York, as well as New Jersey, Illinois, Massachusetts, Ohio, and just most recently, South Carolina. These are all of the states that are infested here in green. There are some of these with just one or two finds in very specific locations. There's others like in New York State where it's a little more widespread. They've also been found in Ontario, Canada. And you can see it there on the right, it looks like an evil insect, one that's planning a lot of destruction, I think, kind of the angry eyebrows, almost like an evil sort of mustache there towards the bottom. It's just not a great bug to be dealing with. There's an adult form next to a penny in a person's hand. It is a large and impressive insect, black in appearance with sort of speckles on its back and then white and black alternating bands on their antenna. So most of the problem sites that we've located have been in urbanized areas here in the US. This makes sense, that's how they kind of get introduced. They end up in these urban spots. But what we're very worried about with this pest is it escaping out into otherwise rural areas. So if you think about a, a pest like this, we don't want it to get into the forest, basically. In an urban setting, there's less for it to eat, but in the woods, there's lots of trees that it's going to infest. The most susceptible tree stands are in the upper Great Lakes, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, as well as over in the New England area. Kentucky, uh, some of the states down this way, they're not listed as susceptible in the forest setting, but that doesn't mean there aren't trees that'll be hurt, especially in our yards and on our streets. Again, this one was most likely introduced through wooden packing materials. Uh, they often contain invasive species. It could have popped out as a larva or as an adult and just gotten loose and started wreaking havoc. They like to attack different genera. So there's 12 different genera that are susceptible to these. The plants that they can infest include maples, buckeyes, elms, willows, and more. It's the maple part that really gets people frightened. Maples are some of our most popular street trees. We also utilize them for a lot of other products. And we just don't like the idea of this beetle sort of stealing all those products from us. So the USDA actually estimates that this beetle probably threatens over 30% of our city forest canopy. So about 30% of the trees that you would see on your, on your street, in your yard, uh, even in smaller towns, this is, this, is sort of a, this is a threat that we have to worry about. They impose as much as a $669 billion threat to the United States. So this is one of the big ones. This is really something to worry about and keep your eyes peeled for and your ears open for. So recreation trees, urban forest canopies, wood products, including maple syrup, can be impacted by this pest. As they get into maples, they destroy its ability to survive, and that could impact the syrup industry. When the female is ready to lay her eggs, she will chew pits in the bark. In order to start laying those eggs, you can see those pits in these two images here. So she uses her large mandibles to chew down into there to give them sort of a recessed area to, to hide the eggs. The eggs will usually hatch in about 13 to 54 days. If they don't hatch before winter, they'll actually hide down in that pit and overwinter and then hatch the next year to be a larva that bores into the tree. They are what we call round-headed borers. This is the opposite of a flat-headed borer like we have with emerald ash borer. So these are bigger and juicier grubs. Their head is round or ovalish in shape. These ones don't just stay towards the outside of the wood near the bark, they actually tunnel down into the heartwood. You can see the Swiss cheese-like log on the right there. That is absolutely destroyed. That tree has been completely eliminated by this bug. Uh, the trees are totally destroyed. It's, it's a very destructive insect once it gets inside of it. They're just tunneling through and devouring as much wood as possible. So some symptoms to be on the lookout for in your maple trees and your buckeye tree and others include large exit holes. You can see the hole that they chew when they leave as an adult is a little smaller than a dime. It's as round as a pencil as well. There will also be weeping sap from the plants. There's cracks in the bark that will appear. The egg laying scars, those pits uh, that I described before. There's also branch dieback and leaf drooping. There's a lot of scarring that happens with this pest. So there are things that we can monitor for. It's one that we definitely want everybody to keep in sort of the forefront of their mind. This pest has already resulted in the removal of over 155,000 trees in the United States. As it stands currently, quarantining an infested area 
and then going through and totally eradicating every possible host tree in that area. That's the go-to method of control. Insecticides thus far have proven not very good. Um, the, their efficacy has varied wildly. Uh, the products that do have some efficacy against it are not widely available. And so right now our go-to move is basically to seal off the area, go through and chop down and chip the possibly infested trees. It's very uh, uh, painful for people to see that. You see a lot of trees disappear very rapidly. Some groups have tried to form resistance in response to this. They don't want the government to do it. And in their heart, they're trying to help trees. But in reality, they're actually helping an invasive pest by fighting these kinds of efforts. It's a hard thing to overcome though, because people care a lot about trees. But part of what we have to do is show people that if this gets loose, we're gonna lose a lot more than what we're chopping down in terms of control. So this is really one of the big ones that we're worried about here in the United States, sort of in the top three of invasive problems. That brings me to the other one that's on our border, the spotted lanternfly. This is another invasive species from Asia. I know that I've mentioned Asia several times already throughout tonight. Uh, that's because Asia and North America share a very similar climate. So we can swap species in some cases. We have given as well as received invasive species. I don't point out that they're from Asia as a slight to that continent or the people that live there. It's not their fault. Uh, it's just a, a, a matter of life that the, the kinds of things that live there are going to do very well in the environments that we provide here in the United States. But this is another one from Asia, also found in Pennsylvania first. Uh, it was found in 2014. They think it may have been introduced as early as 2012 on some infected nursery stock. I think it is an absolutely gorgeous insect. You look at this image, that is a knockout bug, right? Like that's, that's a beauty. All that red there on the back wings, the mixture of spots and stripes, a very daring fashion choice. Some may faux pas, may say faux pas, but I say it's daring, it's innovative. It's just a very distinct and noticeable bug. It's hard to confuse it with other things. So the spread at this point, it's escaped Pennsylvania. It's gotten into New York State. It's been found in Connecticut. It's in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. Uh, it's been found in West Virginia and Virginia as well. And most worryingly for Kentuckians have been the two finds in Ohio and the one in Indiana. So the find that's on the border here with Pennsylvania, that happened in Ohio first. And then just this past summer, just a couple of months ago, actually, there was a find in Switzerland County, Indiana. It's about two miles from the uh, Ohio River, and so therefore only about two and a half miles from Kentucky. It was a very disturbing thing to find. I actually got to go and look at it. Some folks from Indiana invited Kentucky entomologists to come up and see it. Uh, it's, it's, it's scary, honestly, uh, to see how many bugs were present there and to know how close they were to our border. Uh, we thought that might be the only big news for spotted lanternfly this year, but unfortunately there was a find up near Cleveland in Ohio, and just this very morning, as of this recording, September 13th, there was a 4-H'er in the state of Kansas who turned in his entomology collection to the state fair, and it included a spotted lanternfly that he claims he caught in the state of Kansas. So that could be the next big one, is that it's jumped all the way across the Mississippi River, and somehow ended up out there. But nobody has verified that it came from that state yet. Uh, it is very scary though to think that it may have gotten that far. But the one in Switzerland County, Indiana, that's the one that Kentuckians should be thinking about. If you look on the left there, you can see the, the uh, appearance of this insect. It is related to cicadas and it has sort of a similar shape to them. It's part of the same group as the cicadas. They're called hemipterans, also known as true bugs. It includes the cicadas, the stink bugs, the aphids, uh, scale insects, plant hoppers, and also terrible things like the bed bug. The thing that unites this group is their mouth part. They all have needle-like mouth parts that they feed on fluids for food. Uh, and so they all have this sort of proboscis that points down from their face, down their abdomen. They can push it out and poke it into whatever they want to feed on. So you can see it with the aphid plugged into the plant on the left there as it's slowly sucking sap out of that plant. You can see the larger version on the bottom of the spotted lantern fly there. This ensures that they have an all liquid diet. They basically, if they're a plant feeder, they drink maple syrup all day. It's sugar water that they're consuming. It's not very nutritious, so they have to drink a lot of it. Uh, some of them, like the bed bug, they do use it for blood, 
but for the most part, they're feeding on plant blood, the sap, in order to survive. As a uh, rule, this group also develops as nymphs. So they start out as eggs. That's what you see in letter A here. In letter B, we have a young nymph. And then in letter C, we have a slightly older nymph before they reach adulthood. Nymphs are just a different way of talking about immature insects. We use the words nymphs and larva when talking about young bugs. Nymphs look very similar to their adult form. They just lack wings and they grow in size slowly and develop their wings as they age. Larva look very different from their adult form. Think of a caterpillar versus a moth and a butterfly or a white grub versus an adult beetle. They also have to pupate before they get to that adult stage. So it's just a slightly different way of developing and it can help make them easier to identify throughout their life. The nymphs of this species are very interesting looking. They have kind of a Dalmatian appearance when they're small before getting the red on their body. And then as they grow, they get those spotted and striped wings as well. The time that it takes to do this, it varies with the temperature. The eggs typically are seen from September to June. They hatch and then the first instars are seen from April into June. Then the second instars are around from June and July, third instar June to July, then the fourth instar July to September. And then in this part of the year, they're turning into adults more frequently and mating and laying their eggs in September into December. So they can be active throughout the entire year, pretty much. They'll overwinter starting in December, but they have a longer uh, ability, a longer timeline than some of the other bugs that are out there. Those eggs are very interesting, I think. They're laid on many different surfaces. We see them on vines, on fence posts, on stones outside, on the house itself, lawn furniture. Look at these cushions. They're covered in bug eggs, very uncomfortable to sit on. Uh, you can see that they just will use basically any surface. They look like kind of a patch of mud or spackle that's been spushed onto whatever it is that they've chosen to lay their eggs. Each of these egg masses that you see can average about 37, 38 eggs. The maximum they found in Pennsylvania was 78 eggs inside of that muddy stuff. So that's a lot of bugs that we're seeing, particularly on that log and on those cushions. The old egg masses, once they've opened, they look kind of like a coin purse that you would see with quarters and pennies and things in it. And when they're not open, you can see the openings there with the arrow, they're usually covered up with this brown or whitish color epoxy that the female lays on top of it. The female in this GIF, you can see her coating her eggs. She's putting that on top of there. She produces it in her abdomen. This goo she puts over the top of the eggs. It's a protective barrier for them. Uh, scientists in Pennsylvania have discovered that survivorship is much higher in the egg patches that have a nice coating of this epoxy versus the ones that are uncovered. So she's trying to ensure the survival of her young. Here you can see about 75% of the eggs in coated areas will hatch. If they're uncoated, it's under 50%. So that's why that's there. That's why that looks the way it does. The spotted lanternfly here in the United States has a very small list of natural enemies. There's not many things that eat them uh, that are interested in eating them. This has allowed them to thrive in lots of different systems of agriculture. They really love orchards. You can see this apple tree is more bug than tree, I would argue. Uh, that's not good for the health of those apples or that plant or that orchard's uh, back, uh, a wallet. So we have to worry about them in vineyards as well. If you see these grapevines, they're absolutely coated in spotted lanternfly too. So they're all sucking juices from that plant kind of sucking the life from it. They also like to get into homes, just like the brown marmorated stink bug. You go to light a fire in that fireplace, that's a lot of dead bugs to have to clear out. If you look at that tree on the left, that is a ton, a metric ton of, of these spotted lantern fly hanging out there. If I was a kid, I'm not necessarily gonna be using that swing or riding my wagon anywhere near that plant. Uh, these adults are very annoying when they do this. A lot of backyard activities can be ruined and it's not just because they're there. Uh, here's a guy that actually goes off and sweeps them off of his tree. This might be the stuff of nightmares for some folks, but that's a lot of bugs. They're very thick when they start feeding on these trees. They also, as they are feeding, they do this activity where they excrete sugar water. We call this honeydew. Honeydew is just sugar water defecation from the bug. The plant is getting coated in feces made up of its own sap. And this is problematic because it can get sticky all over the place. 
the plant is losing vigor anyway, but now there's going to be sooty mold that's going to develop in all of the sugar water, which is also, it's not necessarily lethal to a plant, but it's not good to have all of this black mold growing on its leaves and on its bark. The sooty mold can also accumulate on steps. This is now a tripping and slipping hazard this step leading up to this home because that's all very slickery sort of uh, honeydew as well as the black sooty mold. That stuff is also dripping constantly. This is an, a gif of them feeding and then pooping. Here's one right here. I think it's this one that's going to kind of hike up its wings and show us how they, oh no, it was this one over here. It's very pressurized, I think is the most polite way to put it. Aphids also produce honeydew, but it just kind of slowly drips. This shoots out of the spotted lanternfly. It, it's very pressurized. Think of what happens to people after they eat at Taco Bell or Chipotle. It's a similar situation. It's constant. It's painful, I assume. And there's just, it's flying all over the place. So this also drips on people and on cars. It's very annoying to have to deal with. They feed on over 70 different host species. They love hardwood trees. They feed on fruits and vegetables. Some of their favorite things are hops and grapes. So if you like beer and wine, those are two things to worry about. They'll also attack maples, so their syrup. Their preferred host is the tree of heaven, though, another invasive species, an invasive plant. I don't know as much about tree of heaven because it doesn't have enough legs to be interesting to me, but I do know that there's a close association between the lanternfly and that plant. The lanternfly actually absorbs chemicals as they feed on that tree and uses them to protect their body. So they're chemically defended by their host. It's a very interesting little symbiosis. Uh, here's the tree of heaven. It's a, like I said, another invasive. Their bark looks sort of cantaloupe-like. They have leaves that sort of resemble a walnut tree, lots of paddle-like seeds that they produce as well, which is one of the reasons that they're so successful. In order to control SLF, the spotted lanternfly, people are going through and eliminating some of the tree of heavens that they find trees of heaven that they find in an area. And then the ones that are left, they treat with a systemic insecticide to kill any lanternflies that land on them. Then you can see how successful that is. So they're sucking up sap that's full of insecticide and it kills them. In Pennsylvania, they also have restrictions and quarantine zones. If you work in an area that is infested, but live in one that isn't, you will have to have a permit in order to drive and park in that area and leave. You can see that they get on the wheel wells of cars. They'll lay their eggs up in there. It's easy to see how these can be easily spread. They also ban trees in Pennsylvania with sticky bands in order to monitor and see if they can find the nymphs crawling up and down them. We have traps in the state of Kentucky right now that are up monitoring for this pest to make sure it hasn't invaded. That leads me to a couple of insects or a couple of problems, I should say that are present in the state of Kentucky, but are not widespread. So invasive species that we have found and detected here, but haven't made the state their home yet. The first one is a non-insect, it's a tick. It's called the Asian longhorned tick. It's an invasive species from Eastern Asia. It was accidentally introduced to the United States sometime before 2015. Nothing very interesting about it in appearance. It's kind of a brownish color, their front legs are longer than some of their others. That's how it gets its name as the longhorned tick. They started in New Jersey and have been slowly moving out since 2015. Sort of like other invasive species, they slowly trickle out. Uh, other invasive species from Detroit can include the Jersey Shore people. And uh, they, they all sort of just like slowly ooze out of that state. If you look on the map on the left there, we can see that while it started in New Jersey, it is now spread to Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, New York. It's also in Virginia and West Virginia and going down into the Carolinas and Tennessee. The three most Western finds were in Missouri and Arkansas. In Kentucky, it has been found five separate times. The findings in this state were uh, in Boone, Floyd, Madison, Martin, and Metcalf counties. The findings have occurred on different hosts. In Floyd County, the first find, it was a black bear. There was a human that had one on it in Madison County. Uh, there was an elk in Martin County, and the last two finds have been in Boone and Metcalf counties, and those involved cattle. Uh, there, were a, there was a bull in Boone County, and I think female cows in Metcalf County that had them on them. This is troubling uh, to find it in the state because this is a projection 
of what they think will happen in the United States with ALT, with the Asian longhorn tick. The states that it will like to live in the most are darker red in color. If you look at Kentucky, it is almost entirely maroon. They really want to live in the bluegrass. They want to see Paducah. They want to see the Dippin' Dots factory that's out there. They want to go on the bourbon trail. They want to see the Louisville Slugger factory in Louisville. It just seems like this state is well set up for them to thrive in. So we're very worried about this pest. And why are we worried? Because of the way that it reproduces. So most ticks, they have males and females. They find one another in the grass. They put on some Marvin Gaye. They mate and they produce eggs. This tick species has been astonishing thus far because it has reproduced solely in the United States in an asexual manner. We have so far only found females. The females reproduce through parthenogenesis where they clone themselves and give birth to their daughter. This is very similar to what we see with aphids. And so an individual female can produce hundreds very quickly, very quickly she can produce hundreds of offspring that are also ready to, to basically give birth to more daughters. And that means that the population can explode rapidly on the animal that they've infested. We haven't seen any disease transmission in the United States with this, but we have seen issues of exsanguination. There was a case in North Carolina where they uh, found that there were, it was cattle. And I think it was five calves. They were fed on so heavily by these ticks that they bled to death into them. So we aren't worried about Lyme with this necessarily. We're not necessarily worried about Rocky Mountain spotted fever or other tick-borne problems, but we are worried that cattle, horses, wildlife, they'll pick up these ticks. Unbeknownst to us, they will have the or ticks reproduce. Okay, what is that? They will reproduce on the, on, the, on, the ear. on the animal and they will boom in population and maybe even kill it by sealing so much of its blood. So those are the things we're worried about with this. Other one I want to mention is the imported fire ant. This is starting to become a worry in Kentucky, has thus far only been found in the land between the lakes area. We've had two people claim to have found it so far this summer in eastern Kentucky. Both of those turned out to not be true, which I count as a really good experience. I appreciate when people contact us. I would rather look at 100 things that aren't the invasive species than miss the one that is. So we haven't seen it anywhere else. There are red fire ants and then black imported fire ants. They can also hybridize. We believe that the hybrid is the one that's more common in the state of Kentucky. So these are finds that have been verified in the LBL area by the Office of the State Entomologist. The leading theory right now is that the ants invaded the state by floating. So ants in a lot of cases, and particularly with fire ants, when a flood comes into an area, they will ball together and make these rafts of ants. And then those rafts can be transported on creeks and streams and rivers and get to new areas. So we think that these floated up from Tennessee and got into the LBL area. Uh, sometimes they're also picked up in dirt, which is transported. But the leading theory right now is that they flooded in to the state of Kentucky. These are a biting and stinging hazard. You can see what they do when they get on your skin. They pinch you and then they stab you with their, their butt needle. And you can see what happens there on the right. You get this pimple-like pusture. It's a raised red and white red elk or welt. It burns and itches. It is very uncomfortable. I have met people that have been uh, stung by these and none of them have described it as a pleasant experience. They do create distinctive domed mounds, which are very helpful for identification. If you see the one on the left there, here's the same spot though, after it hasn't been mowed. So the problem here is that now you can't see the mound. They do often get mowed over, and then the operator of the mower is very unhappy because they're covered in unhappy ants. They do love open areas, so they'll often end up in lawns, sports fields, golf courses, parks, pastures, hay fields, vegetable fields, the roadside. When they're not controlled, the mound densities in any given area, uh, you can see 50 to 200 mounds per acre. That's a lot of ants and a lot of stingers that are out there. This is a list of things that the Office of the State Entomologist sent me. They're discussing a possible quarantine of the area out by the land between the lakes with the USDA. This would mostly impact farmers who rent land for hay. Uh, they would have to, the hay would have to be picked up from the field the day it's baled. Can't just be sitting around. They don't want to ship this problem across the state. It could be logging impacts because the equipment might move soil, which could hold the ants. 
Uh, there are no nurseries within the land between the lakes, so it wouldn't impact them. But there's some questions about what we're going to do to try and stop this. I, for one, hope it never gets out of the LDL area. I also put in a bonus insect for today. I know it was called six insects, uh, six invasives to watch out for, but since I've gotten so many questions on them lately, I thought I would include the murder hornet. Uh, the murder hornet in the news that we hear a lot about has not been found in Kentucky. It's not been found in Maryland. It has only been found in British Columbia, Canada, and the state of Washington. There's currently no consensus how the Asian giant hornet, which is its true common name, uh, was actually brought to North America. There's a couple of theories. One of them is that somebody did it to try and raise them in order to put them in alcohol. There are some folk remedies that involve them. And there's also a type of liquor where you put these hornets at the bottom and it absorbs the properties of the venom supposedly. Uh, so those are possibilities. It's not entirely clear how they got to the States, how they got to North America. This is a large and impressive insect, as you can see in the image on the right there. The name murder hornet comes from a New York Times article, and they got that name because they are reported in their native habitat of Asia to be responsible for about 50 deaths every year. If you look on the left there, that's their stinger. Pretty big, pretty large and in charge. I have read different reports from scientists, Japanese scientists and others in Asia that have been stung by these, they describe it as a red hot nail being driven into your skin. They also call this in its native range, the sparrow wasp or the sparrow hornet because of their size. It rivals that of a sparrow in their mind. I would say for comparison, we do see about 50 to 70 deaths every year from just honeybees and wasps in the United States. So it's not completely crazy that these kill 50 people every year. That is true, it's very painful. It can cause pain to the skin and necrotic lesions left untreated, but they're not out there murdering people. They're not out there looking to harm us necessarily. They are more famous also for their predation on European honeybees. So giant hornets, hornets in, part, in general, like to eat honeybees. They're a good food resource, but the Asian giant hornet in the autumn, they switch from eating other things besides bees to basically going into a pure honeybee diet. And they love European honeybees because they have very little defense against the Asian giant hornet. So what they do is they fly up to the honeybee, they grab it like you see on the left there, they cut off its head and legs and they crunch up the rest of the insect into what is described in the scientific literature as a bee meatball. And then they take that back home and feed it to their children. They also invade the nests of European honeybees. You can see on the right there, three hornets getting ready to go into one, three hornets in a group will enter a slaughter phase where they can kill 30,000 or so honeybees in about 30 minutes. They then steal all of the larvae in the colony and take those home and feed them to their larvae. So it is a very vigorous insect in that way. We have multiple lookalikes in the state of Kentucky. The European hornet is the most similar. It's there on the left. It is, if you have an untrained eye, it looks identical, basically. They're almost the same size. They're basically the same color. The key differences are that the European hornet, the head and thorax are much more red on top, and the pattern on the abdomen is also different. If you look at the European hornet, you can see, I think they look like angry penguins. Uh, there's this sort of eyebrow and then the eyes that go through on the pattern. The Asian giant hornet is mostly banded. There's very little in terms of circles or dots that appear on the abdomen. The cicada killer is another one that people confuse for it. They have a very different profile. They're thinner. Their head is a lot smaller than the Asian giant hornet as well. Uh, and they don't defend themselves as vigorously as the, Europe, as the Asian hornet does. Then bald-faced hornets. These are large yellow jackets, which are white and black, which is very different in coloration compared to the Asian giant hornet. Also wanted to show you some mug shots of these. So the European hornet there on the left, you can note that it has the kind of red on top, red hair on top, red, uh, mutton chops on the side. The cheeks are kind of thinner as well, uh, quote unquote cheeks. That is found here in Kentucky. The cicada killer, her head is mostly eyes. You can see it's also much thinner. There's not the large predaceous jaws. They don't attack and eat other insects. So they don't need these big choppers like the European hornets and Asian giant hornets do. The Asian giant hornet is much, has a larger and rounder head. I sympathize with that. It's hard to find hats. 
but they also have much more of a pumpkin orange coloration to their head, their thorax, and most of their body. And just to reiterate, that is not known to be in Kentucky. We do get a lot of inquiries about that here in the state, though. The problems with these pests, they are the ones that uh, they can get loose and cause a lot of issues. The ones that get out there into the environment, they are normally found by folks who work in the field. Uh, people that are out in the environment looking around, having fun or working, and then they report it to somebody. So <clears throat> groups of folks that enjoy nature, they're the ones that help us to combat these pests. If you see something weird, let us know. Uh, you can turn in images, videos, you can find your local master gardener groups, you can find your local extension offices, uh, your local university entomology department. All of those groups would love to, to be able to make sure that they don't have an invasive pest coming into their territory. So if you see something weird, let somebody know is the basic message. With that, I thank you for your time and your attention here this evening.